All right, I want to talk about this board game I've had for a few years. It was given to me. It's originally 19, I think, 61, Milton Bradley. And they did it along with the American Heritage. So there was a magazine or some pamphlet or something that came with this. I don't have it. But it's a Civil War game called Battle Cry. And you can play two to four players. Um, and it's about the Civil War. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what the board looks like in the pieces. So the board kind of unfolds like that. And you have the uh, blue is the north. This is the south. And these are the neutral territories, the green. There's one over here. And then the playing pieces are three. And one of them is infantry. And these are all plastic. So you have the gray for the south and the blue for the north infantry. And you get 10 of those for each player. You're going to get some cavalry. And again, these are 10 for each player. And the final piece is artillery. And you're going to get two <laughs> pieces of artillery per player. Now, normally when you get, oops, I just dropped it. Normally when you get the game, these pieces just kind of go in those slots like that. So that's how the game is stored. I'm going to go ahead and take those out. So you have one for the north and one for the south. So this is not a very complicated game. All you're trying to do is eliminate the opponent's pieces. But that's the strange thing about this game is how combat happens. I would say this is more of an abstract war game with a theme of civil war put onto it. And you'll see what I'm talking about when we get to how you battle. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get the board set up. What I forgot to mention also is that you're going to need two dice. And then on the back of that box was the actual rules to the game. So I actually got the game kind of like this. <laughs> so there's the instructions to the game. It's not a very complicated game. There are a few twists with combat how it works, but the rest of it is really, really simple. So this is the setup. And how you know where to put each piece is, wherever it has an I, you put infantry. Wherever it has a C, you put the cavalry piece. And wherever it has an A, you put an artillery piece. And both players do that, so the game's always going to start the same way every time. And I'm going to bring this down just a little bit, because there are some men up there. So this is how you're going to start, and south always begins. Now, you get to move your pieces. And I'll go to more in depth on some of these special places, such as the rail lines, these red it's running through here. There's some mountains. I'll get to that. But the basic things you do is you roll the dice, and you got three. That is how far you get to move. It's three. three. Now, infantry will move one space for every point you put into it. So one, two, three, if you want to do that. Cavalry gets to move one, two spaces for each point you put in. Same with artillery. They get to move two spaces for every. So it'd be one, two, three. Um, I will say there's no diagonal movement. And facing is important in this game. You may not think so, but it is. So if your infantry is facing that way, he cannot attack to the side and to the back. So if this guy is facing that way, just kind of give an example, he can attack forward. But can't, of course, you can't go diagonal and attack. He can only attack forward, he can't attack his flank, and he can't attack his rear. So if you decide to go that direction, you're going to have to turn and face that direction. Then if you decide to go up, you're going to turn and go up. So there is facing in this game. And that's pretty much it. If you got five, what do you want to move? And you can move one, one, this one, two, three, four, Five. It doesn't have to be the same piece. It could be multiple pieces, as long as your total movement doesn't go over what you rolled. That's pretty much how you move. Now, you can't have two pieces in the same square, and you cannot go through a square occupied by another piece. Um, you can't go 
off the board, of course, and you can't go into the water because there's no squares there, so you can only move where there are squares. And also, you know how you can move two? You can just move one if you want to. I forgot to say that, but just you can go up to two for one movement. Now with the mountains, these little symbols here, if your piece ever enters a mountain, it has stopped, it can't move any further. The next turn, it can go on as long as it doesn't go onto another mountain piece. So mountain piece stops movement. Now, these are railroads, and that allows you some very, very fast movement. You can only enter where there's a dot, and you can only leave where there's a dot. So you can't get on here and then get off here. If you get on here, you can travel up to there if you want to. Now how that works is it costs one movement to get on that dot, no matter your speed. So even if it's a horse and this took, it can normally move two, that's one. Two. To the next dot is another movement. Three, four, and so forth. Same for infantry and cannons. That costs one, two, three, four, five. Now, if you notice this one goes through the mountains, it doesn't stop it. So you can go, let's say you went got on here, one, two, three, four, five. You can do that. And if you got movement left over, let's say this has got three movement, one, two, three. You can do that. So mountains do not stop railway, railway traffic. And it's a quick way to get around the board. Now a few other things about the railroad. If these guys go through here, one, two, they don't stop. This doesn't bother them. They just continue their movement. One, two, one, oh, I can't go diagonal. One, two, one, two, and so forth. So it doesn't stop. Now, if this happens to be on the rail, the gray, south player, the gray player, it does nothing to them. They can just go on through that but the blue player cannot pass through where this one's at, so he has to stop here. So you can block the opponent from using certain rail lines. And also, if anybody's on that dot, what do you get on? Friend or foe, you cannot use it. So if the, say they want to get their infantry on here, he would first have to move that, oops, do your facing, since he went that way, and then go one, two, three, four, and so forth. So it can, rail lines can be blocked. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna clear this board off and discuss how you do battles. And this is where the abstract part of the game comes into play because the battles are very, I would say, unique in this game. So what I need to do is go over the values each of these have in combat. Now, in movement, cavalry and the artillery move really fast, but infantry is kind of slow. Um, it changes up a little bit in this game um, in that infantry have a combat value of 2, and so do the artillery. So artillery moves to combat value 2. Infantry moves 1, but combat value 2. Two. And then your cavalry is your weakest in combat. It can move two, but only has a combat value of one. And what's nice is they put over here on the board on the side, here's their move and their combat value. So if you're not sure, there it is. So just remember, combat, these are ones and these are twos. All right, so let's set this up. What you have to do after you're done with all of your movement, once you start this, you can't go back to movement. This is a, like a freebie. It's like a turn, turn sequence. First sequence is roll your dice. Second sequence is move whoever you're going to move on your side. Third, do your combats. Then it's next player's turn. They roll their dice. They do their movements. Then they do their combats. OK, so how combat happens is, this is so bizarre, but um, I'm going to show you. So let's say we've got this situation. These are three infantry here and one infantry here. This is worth six, this is worth two. It's the blues player's turn. They take the last piece and jump to that empty space. This is eliminated. 
So, like I said, it's like an, it's an abstract game because in real combat, you don't go jumping over soldiers to kill them and then end up away from your other forces. Now, if there was a blue player there, he can't jump to that last empty space. He cannot attack. So your value has to be more. If this one won to attack, he does not have enough value. Maybe he starts bringing up more pieces of equipment to get his strength up equal, still can't attack him, and so forth. So you have to have more than the opponent's value. And then you do your jump, and you take theirs away, and uh, one stays where it jumped. Can't do any more movements after that. You can go to another battle, though. That battle's over. Now, I will say, let's say this is the situation. Okay, So this guy's, they've got this one beat. They can jump to this empty space here, which takes this guy out. He is a higher level than this one. And he can go ahead and take that one out, too. Because remember, this one's worth a one. That even includes if it's off to the side. So let me set this up again. So we got this situation. They beat this one. It's Blue's turn. They beat this one. They jump. Get this. Well, he can beat that horse. So he jumps. He can jump sideways also, just not diagonal. And now they've taken two pieces out, and they're in that situation. Now, here comes some of your restrictions. If you're using a cavalry piece to attack with, I'm actually, yeah, we'll just do it this way. If you're using a cavalry piece and it's in your attack and you want to take out the opponent, so we got a cavalry piece here, you have, he has to be in front. Now, if you've got multiple cavalry, you only have to have one of them in front, not both of them. Now, if it starts off that way, you could do your jump, take that guy out, and so forth. But if that cavalry piece is not in front, you can take, you can roll your moot, you know, do your normal movements. Instead of moving some of the other soldiers, you can try one, two, three, four. You know, trying to get that guy in there, and so forth. Toys up front. Your your movement's done. Now you can do your attack and take it out. So if you have cavalry in there, one of the cavalry has to be in front for you to be able to attack. Artillery. So I'm going to take this soldier out and we'll put artillery in here to attack. And if you have an artillery piece in here, unlike the horses have to be at the front, it has to be at the end. And if you have multiple pieces in there of artillery, you only have two. Um, one of them has to be in the back. So horses, at least one has to be in the front if it's in there. Artil horses are cavalry. Artillery, at least one of them has to be in the back if it's there. Now, what's nice about this is the artillery piece does not jump. It pretends to jump what they would normally jump. It stays there and removes those pieces. So that's a nice thing about having the artillery at the end. It can take away those pieces without having to lose your line of men. Now let's go back to this situation where before the soldier couldn't jump there because that guy's blocking it because you need the empty space. Well, this cannon goes, you don't need the empty space. Take him out. But you don't get that multiple kill like that uh, foot soldier can do. So that's the nice thing about the cannon. One other rule about artillery is it's got this, I'm going to have to put a cavalry up here because cavalry is worth one, and this is worth two. So you think, okay, take it out. Cal, uh, artillery can never attack by itself. So it's always going to have to have either or, uh, infantry there or another cavalry to help it attack. It can never attack solo. So if it's by itself, it's going to have its own little problems. Because all it takes is just three points, boom, the artillery piece is gone. It can't even, def it can't attack back. Now, a couple other situations that may come up, and this is why facing is important too, because um, if this guy's facing that way and this one's facing this way, they're not in a line. This one's facing that one and this one's facing this way. So let's just have this. And then we've got these line of soldiers here. Um, let me get some soldiers. Here, there we go. 
Now, they're facing that way. They're facing that way. It doesn't really matter because they're looking at this one horse here. They can beat it and take it out. They don't take the whole row. It's what they're jumping over. So you can attack the opponent's flank. I guess it would be the flank if you want. You don't have to line up and attack all of them at once. You can take them out piecemeal like this, but then the opponent's going to get their turn to try to do something to you. So you can attack and just take one piece out if you want. All right, one final thing, to, way to eliminate an opponent is if, I can't use a cavalry. Um, well, I could use a cavalry because he could actually be supplemented. I'm going to have two cavalry here. How about that? And we're going to put another soldier over here. So this one can't move at all. He's completely surrounded. This is worth two. This is worth two. This is worth two. This is worth two. He's worth two. So he can't beat any of them. If the piece cannot be moved, it is surrounded. It is just eliminated. So that's another way to eliminate a piece is surrounding it. And that includes, I'm going to move the soldier down here to the water. Let's say this is a situation. No squares back there. He can't go back there. He can't go forward to these spaces. He's surrounded. He's eliminated. So remember, you can only move to where's a, where there is a square. And that's pretty much it. Just uh, when one side eliminates the other side's pieces, the game is over. I haven't played this one in a long, long, long time, but you know, I'm wanting to play this one again. It's, again, just an abstract war game with a Civil War theme pasted on, I would say. And from what I remember of it, I, my friends and I did enjoy it. So that is Battle Cry.